Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Year 11 curriculum evening. As you can see, it's Mr. Scott Evans here, um, broadcasting from my office today. Um, would have been nice to have you all here in the main hall, but actually lots of parents saying this is uh, a good way for you to join us for evenings like this. Um, so hopefully you're sitting comfortably. Um, I don't know where you are. Maybe some of you are joining us from work. Some of you tuning in on the train on the way home. I don't know, but um, I've got a couple of colleagues here to help me this evening. As you can see, I've got uh, Miss Brown, head of year 11 with me and Mrs. Trebess, who's the deputy head in charge of curriculum. And together we're going to hopefully give you a lot of information that's going to help you this evening. Um, we will uh, share a summary of some of the most important slides from this evening, and that will be sent as a PDF to you by email in the next day or two. Um, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions this evening. Um, those should be focused on year 11. Uh, some of you may have questions about sixth form. We're talking a lot about that in school at the moment, but there are other presentations about that. Um, so, I mean, feel free to fire them in. If we've got time, we'll, we'll cover some sixth form questions, but we're mainly focusing on year 11 um, this evening. You can put your questions into the chat um, whenever you like. They uh, will not appear to other parents. They will only appear to us. And we've got Mr. Fenn with us this evening as well, who will be monitoring the chat and will be asking us some of the questions that you've put in there uh, later on. If we run out of time, then we will continue to answer those questions um, and send you a written response um, to, to everyone via email. We'd love to do this in an hour this evening and finish at half past six, um, but this is a really important meeting. So if necessary, we'll overrun by 15 minutes to keep answering your, your questions at the end. Um, I'd like to start this evening by telling Year 11s uh, a story that I've been telling Year 11s um, since we um, first started having this meeting when we first opened the school. Uh, and it's about uh, an airline uh, flight called United Airlines Flight 173. I don't know whether you've ever heard about this this flight, but it was a it was a very standard internal flight um, in America. It was a, a flight from JFK in New York to Portland, Oregon, and it it, sh it, it took place in 1978. Uh, the pilot on this flight was someone called McBroom. Uh, he was 52 years old. He'd been a pilot in the Second World War and he had 25 years of experience flying aeroplanes. With him were two other experienced pilots, uh, Roderick Beek, uh, aged 45, and Forrest Mendenhall, aged 41. And they both had more than a decade's experience flying for uh, United Airlines. Everyone on this flight should have felt that they were in good hands uh, because of the experience of these pilots. There are 181 passengers on the uh, the plane and after a brief stop in Denver they were flying this final part of the trip which was due to take two hours and 26 minutes. All was going well and at 10 past five they were given permission to land by air traffic control. So the pilot, who remember his name was McBroom, pressed the button for the wheels to lower from the aeroplane. And there should have been a nice reassuring click as the wheels came into place. But instead, there was a horrendous thud and the whole aeroplane shook. So you can imagine the, 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 the fear and concern on the flight from the passengers, but also from the pilot, because that obviously isn't supposed to, to happen. And what he wasn't sure about is what had actually happened. Had the landing gear lowered, had the wheels lowered to help him land the plane or not? So um, he, he requested some time to consider things and, and can, went into a holding pattern around the, the airport. And he tried to complete checks to see whether the wheels were down, but obviously he couldn't see underneath the aeroplane. So all he could do was check the dials and the lights uh, in front of him. All the indications were that actually the landing gear had lowered, but he couldn't be sure. 
and he just got himself into a right state about it. He, he was just worrying and worrying about the wheels um, rather than trusting the information in front of him. Now, actually, although it's not ideal, you can land a plane without the landing gear down. I mean, it sounds horrendous, but it, it, it can actually be done. Um, but he didn't want to take that risk because obviously that is a dangerous thing to do. And he wasn't sure whether the wheels really had lowered. So he just continued going round and round and round. And he actually did that for over half an hour going round and round and round, not getting on with landing the plane. And what happened was they actually started to run out of fuel. And the other people in the cockpit with him, the other pilots started saying to him, look, we need to do something because we can't just stay up here flying round and round and round. We need to land the aeroplane. Um, but he, he just stuck in this holding pattern. And then they all realised that he'd actually now left it too late. And um, he couldn't land the, 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 the plane because there wasn't enough fuel left. Now, we're all very conscious of petrol at the moment and the importance of fuel. I bet some of you are concerned about how many more trips you can do in your car. If you run out of fuel in the middle of the, you know, the, the, the motorway or on the A12, you're in real trouble. Fuel is the essential in this situation. This perfectly capable um, pilot had got himself into a complete mess. A perfectly capable pilot who could have landed the plane, regardless of whether the landing gear was down or not, um, actually created a, a disaster. Whilst he was still eight miles away from the airport, he ran out of fuel. The aeroplane ran out of fuel completely. And so he ended up crashing the plane without fuel. Remember, he could have landed it, but without fuel, you are completely stuffed. He crashed into houses. Uh, he was traveling at 3000 feet per minute. Some of you will have to convert that into miles an hour for me, but that's fast. 3000 feet per minute. 50 feet per second, he crashed into houses and trees. Uh, eight passengers sadly died in this horrendous crash. Amazingly, no one died on the ground in those houses and things that he crashed into. There were no fatalities. But actually, one of the people that died was the co-pilot, Mendel Hall, who was trying to tell him we need to land this plane. McBroom had to live with that for the rest of his life. It's a horrendous story and, and the reason I tell it is because I want to sort of shock you this this evening that actually you're a bit like that pilot. You're a bit like McBroom and you are flying an aeroplane at the moment. Now, at the moment, you have everything going for you. We are getting into the final stages of our flight. We're getting into the final stages of your education. You're now pressing the button saying, right, I'm in year 11 and the landing gear should now be coming down. 11 years of education have got you ready for this moment and you should be getting ready to land. But the, the issue that you've got against you is fuel. Your time is, is running out. Now you have got plenty of time like McBroom to land the plane successfully, to succeed in taking your exams at the end of year 11. You have got plenty of time, but you have to be conscious of it. You have to realise that time is running out. You've actually got 39 weeks left, I think, roughly between now and you sitting your exams. 39 weeks. Your exams are going to take place in the middle of May and you need to be ready for them. Um, your teachers are a bit like the co-pilots uh, who are there with you trying to support you, but you are the pilot. You have to land the plane. They can't do it for you. They can't grab the wheel and do it for you. Um, your parents are a bit like uh, the air traffic control. They'll be able to send you messages and send you signals and say, you're OK, you can do this. You can land the plane. Go ahead. But again, they can't land the plane for you either. They can't sit the exams for you. Neither can, neither can I. You're the only person who can do that. You've got to use the time that you've got left very, very carefully. I fully believe that you are all like McBroom, fully capable of landing this plane. I have every confidence in you. What is against you is time. And so you've got to use that time productively. 
um, you know, sometimes I see you on the playground, don't I, at the end of lunch and I'm rushing you off to lessons. I feel like sometimes you haven't got that sense of urgency of I need to get off to my lessons in time because I've only got 39 weeks left. I, I want to finish my story um, before I hand over to Mrs Trebess by reading to you a letter that I received from a student in our founding cohort who ran out of time. This is what he wrote to me. Dear Mr Scott Evans, is there any chance that you can possibly help me as you've been with me all the way through my time at St Thomas's and at Beckett Keys? I'd actually known him since he was seven years old, so we'd known each other for a long time. I know this is unusual, but I feel like I've let the school, my family and myself down with my results. I feel like I could have achieved so much more. I feel like I still can and I would love to be able to stay at Beckett Keys for sixth form. I now regret so much not listening to my parents, teachers and yourself and feel like I've let myself down as well. I know I've got so much more to achieve and offer. I'd still love to do this if there's any way you could please give me a second chance. I promise not to let you and my family down again. This was a student who hadn't lived up to his potential. He hadn't used the time that he had in year 11 to good effect and he didn't make it into our sixth form. We weren't able to magically change his, his grades so he could meet our entrance requirements. I don't want any of you to be writing a letter like that. So I'm telling you this story and warning you that you've got 39 weeks left. You're running out of time. We have been communicating with you in school. Um, I've also been communicating with you, Mrs Trebess has, um, via emails and, and letters that we've been sending home. Um, we're now going to hand over to Mrs Trebess, who's going to talk to you a bit about some of those messages we've been sending home and the excellent Year 11 parent guide um, that you've all received. So Mrs Trebess, you want to come up and yes. take over? Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. So yes, I'm going to be talking to you about the logistics of Year 11, really, um, and about how students can start to think about organising themselves and their revision. And then I'm going to talk, hand over to Miss Brown, who's going to talk to you a bit more about your health and wellbeing. So yes, I'm hoping that you've all received um, the parent information guide for Year 11. In this guide is loads and loads of essential information including information about the content of the GCSE courses and how students will be assessed. That's kind of the bulk of the guide. There's also information about recommended revision guides that students um, might want to buy for their different subjects. Um, and at the beginning of the guide is all the important dates that you will need in terms of exams coming up, mock exams, parents evenings, sixth form events, um, so please, please keep that guide safe so that you can reference it throughout the year. I think most people now are quite familiar with the new grade structure, but it's just worth running you through it. Um, basically, a grade four GCSE is what's called a standard pass, and that's kind of the equivalent of an old C grade. A five is considered a strong pass, and that's the equivalent of a low B grade. You can see that at the top end, the new system of grading allows for greater differentiation at the top end. So an A and an A star is now divided into a seven, eight and nine. And a grade nine is actually the top 3% of the old A star. So it's, it's really, really um, very, very few students achieve the grade nine. So students completed exams back at the end of year 10, they year 10 mock exams. Some of them weren't too impressed with the grades that they got. Now we at school appreciate how difficult it was at the end of last year for students taking the exams after a very interrupted and disjointed year because of COVID. We didn't have the same opportunities in school to practice exam skills and to build analytical skills um, that are required for, for those GCSE exams. And so we're going to be doing our very best to address that, this. It's very important um, that students apply themselves, that they're organised and they're working hard at independent and revising, but we're going to be supporting them with that. 
it's worth knowing that students who take their year 10 exam usually improve by around one or two grades by the end of their GCSEs. And with, we're perhaps anticipating that students this year, um, that progress will be even greater um, because of the sort of year they had last year. So the, the message is really don't panic, but we do need students to be working hard and building on the success they had in their year 10 exams. So as a result of those exams, your teachers um, have been meeting together, they've been analysing the data, we've been looking at um, which questions students didn't perform quite so well on, which topics need to be retaught, what needs to be revised and practised. And heads of department in a lot of cases have been changing schemes of work in order to support students better in year 11. So our whole curriculum really has been designed by how well students did in the exam and the gaps and the um, bits that they need to do more of. We can also use what we call question level analysis. So we look at each question in the exam on which students didn't do so well on different questions. And we've used that as well to identify students who need support with particular areas. Some students, not great numbers of students, but some students have been identified already for lesson seven intervention. And you will have had a letter about that if your child has been involved in any of those interventions. You can see um, that English and maths are there from our course subjects on a Monday and a Thursday. And you can see that the other slots have been taken largely by what we call NEA subjects. They are subjects in which they have a non-exam assessment or what you might have known it as coursework. Um, we've prioritised those subjects in the first term because we think it's really important that students get those coursework projects up and running. Um, so that they can finish them in good time and later in the year they'll have that time back to revise for their other subject. So we've prioritised those in the first term. Now we will be changing the intervention groups after the October holiday um, because there'll be three weeks then in the run up to the mock exams and I know that more departments will be clamouring for time to spend with students after school um, in lesson sevens after school. So you will be getting another email shortly if your child is required to attend those interventions. Please don't worry if your child hasn't been selected for this first wave of intervention. There will be more waves and what you need to remember is that most of the learning happens in lessons and through homeworks. Intervention is not a silver bullet. It doesn't miraculously um, help students to suddenly achieve. We have some students who say, you know, can I come to lesson seven? And they think that's the kind of the, the cure all um, for, for them not doing so well in their year 10 exams. It's not. The main progress is made in their lessons and doing their homework. But if you do want to be um, into lesson seven interventions, then yes, there will be other waves in the year and you'll probably be invited at another time. We do carefully select students um, for small groups in these lesson seven interventions, and it might be that it's just not suitable for your child at this particular time. So other interventions that we offer, um, I usually say at this point, please don't go on holiday until July. Um, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, but actually, um, you do need to be thinking about that because inevitably there will be interventions running in holidays. Um, we'll send invites out a few weeks before those holidays. Um, and if they're not selected for interventions during the holidays, it is you know, highly likely that they'll have lots of revision tasks and revision to do at home during those holidays. Um, you'll notice that the Christmas holiday is not there. We believe that students should be having a break at Christmas, as should teachers. And we, we try, although we haven't always been successful in keeping the second week of the Easter holiday free so that students can have some sort of a break. Um, but we do try and keep interventions going through the holidays because it works well. Um, and if you are in invited for those sessions, we really do suggest that you um, you send your children into school during the holidays. So the October holiday week at the moment is looking like this. We haven't sent those invites out yet, but we will be doing very shortly. Um, we've only got at the moment Monday and Tuesday of the October holiday and we always try and do this. We always try and do the interventions kind of in a block so that there are days either side when they can have time off. So at the moment it's looking like just the Monday and Tuesday will be saved for interventions. So the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday 
looks like it will be free for them to do revision at home and have a break. Important date for you is Monday the 22nd of November. That's when their first mock exam begins. Uh, likely to take place over a two week period. We're trying to give students as realistic an experience as possible for the exams. So it's likely that they'll have multiple papers in each subject. Important that they have that practice and they have the experience of sitting those exams um, over a two week period. Once they've completed their exams, we'll be rapidly marking them and analysing them in the same way we did with the year 10 exams. And we'll feed those results back to students and to parents as quickly as possible. And we'll be making what the next steps are clear to students. It's possible that they may have some follow up work to do over the Christmas holiday. There will be another mock exam as well. That exam um, takes place in late February, early March. So they have another opportunity to practice the exams then as well before their real exams in the summer. Um, this is just um, this is a timetable from last year, so please don't look too closely at this, but this is just to demonstrate that a mock exam timetable will be published and um, it will be published on the website. You, it will be sent home to you in an email, but it will also be on the website so that you can help your child to plan exactly their revision in line with the exams that they have coming up. So on this example, it's not the real one, but in this example, obviously English comes very early in the series. They'll want to be focusing their English revision um, first because they're the first exams that come in the two week session. Worth bearing in mind that when we do do the mock exams, some of them finish before 10 past three and students will be leaving slightly early on those days. Um, otherwise, they'll be ten attending school as usual and attending their normal lessons where they don't have an exam. So they won't have study leave um, for mock exams. Um, the GCSE NEAs, the non-exam assessments, um, you will be sent the dates for those if your child is sitting in NEA, so subjects like food, like drama, like art, like textiles will have a non-exam assessment element of the course and we'll be telling you when the deadline for those NEAs are so that you can support your child in meeting those targets. Um, many of the design subjects run open evenings so parents can go in, you can see completed portfolios and design projects and you're absolutely aware of what the expectations are, what a grade nine looks like, what a grade eight looks like, how a grade five student can move from a grade, grade five to a grade six. Um, those open evenings are really invaluable in helping parents to understand exactly what's involved in those coursework projects so that you can support them at home. So information on those will also follow. I'm going to talk to you a bit about revision now. That statistic that you can see on your screen, 87% and 13%, 87% is the time that students have outside of school and 13% is the proportion of time that they spend in school. So you can see that the majority of students' time is actually spent outside of school. So what they do with that time inevitably is going to have a huge impact on how well they do in their exams. Two of the most effective revision techniques are practicing exam questions and spacing revision out. They're two of the most researched effective revision techniques. Passively reading a textbook or even worse, buying a load of textbooks and sticking them on their shelf in the bedroom and hoping that through some magical process of osmosis, they will absorb um, what's in them. Um, isn't isn't going to work. In addition, students think sometimes that working hard is the answer. I'm working really hard, Miss, at home. But if that hard work isn't well directed into tasks that make progress better, then that hard work isn't going to pay off. So making sure that the activities students are doing at home are appropriate and helpful is just as important as the number of hours that they put in. Testing, it's proven that testing is not just a means of assessing what students have learned, it's actually a powerful means of improving learning. By, by doing past examination papers, by practicing retrieving information, by 
um, talking about things that they've learned and recalling things that they've learned. Students are learning. Oh, I got that wrong. What did I get wrong? OK, next time it comes up, I'll get it right. So past test papers, testing themselves, really, really important ways of um, revising. And obviously these slides are coming round. There are some links that I've put on the slide um, that link to articles that detail some of the research that have gone into some of these revision techniques. So testing yourself is really important and the way that you present the information to test yourself with is really important. So flashcards, mind maps, past examination papers are all really effective ways of making revision more effective. Don't avoid the hard stuff. Students tend to, um, I'm an English teacher, and when I test students on quotations, they all know the quotations from Act 1, and very few of them know the quotations from Act 5, because they start at the beginning each time, and they never quite get through to the end. So not avoiding the hard stuff, keep testing yourself on the stuff that you know, makes you feel better, but actually you're not making the progress that you should. So you've really got to get through that mental barrier and, and do the hard stuff. Um, lots of recall, key quotations, equations, facts, and starting now is really, really important. All of our students have access to GCSE pod. Um, it's a software program that we have at school. Students have access to it. They've all got a login. Um, it's not the be all and end all and they shouldn't use it all the time. It's the kind of thing that they can stick their earphones in and watch a short video. They could do it on the bus, possibly in the evenings when they've done their hard revision. Um, but that's available to them as well. So in addition to testing themselves, spaced learning is another effective learning techniques technique. Five hours of time spent in smaller chunks and spaced periodically, far more effective to learn something than five hours spent the night before. We all know that, don't we? But whether we actually put that into practice and make sure that we're revising far enough out is another matter. Um, the sooner that you can start revising, the more effective it is and the less stressful it becomes at the end. This graph I think is really, really interesting. So the first blue graph, the lowest, the lowest line, shows that if you are if you learn something, by the time it gets to five weeks, if you haven't returned to it, you've basically forgotten all that information. Your memory has not retained it. The pink line shows that if you revisit that information after one week, the loss of that information is much slower and stops at a higher level. So in effect, you retain more of that information after week one. And so it goes on. If you revisit it again in week three and week four, then by the time you get to sort of five, weeks five and six is sort of the key point, then most of that information has been retained in the longer term memory. And that's where it stays. So you can imagine that if a student keeps doing that, keeps revisiting things in short chunks, they've got much less to have to revise right at the end of the course. Um, if they're revising as they go along, they retain it. If not, then if you think about all of their subjects being on that blue line at the bottom, they've suddenly got a huge amount to do to get that information, knowledge and retention back up to where it needs to be. So short, sharp, often regular, revisiting, spacing, very, very important. So small daily improvements are the key to long term results, something, a message that you can keep hold of today um, and think about for the future. In school, um, we've got some learning journals that students complete during form time, all about revision activities, um, the way that they learn best. Um, to tailor their revision to them. Ms Brown's going to talk to you more about activities that happen during form time to support revision. Um, on the 3rd of November, this is one of the dates in the front of your booklets, we have a company coming into school, an external company coming into school to deliver a session called ACE Your Exams. Um, so they'll hear information about how to revise better, how to learn for exams um, from an outside agency. And as part of that package that we're buying in for them, they'll also have access to a learning portal all year, which will support them in developing their revision skills. Um, the same company is also offering parent workshops. You're going to be able to attend parent webinars at least every three months about how to support your child at home. And I'll be 
emailing you with dates to confirm when those webinars will take place. So we're also going to help you to support your child. Um, another important event, and this is the final slide from me, um, is the 13th of January. After they've done their first lot of mock exams, we've marked it. We'll be inviting you um, to join the system on the website for parents evening, um, meeting with teachers in the new year, discussing next steps. OK, thanks very much. I'm going to hand over to Miss Brown who's going to talk to you a little bit about mental well-being and staying well during year 11. Good evening, everybody. Um, so as uh, Mrs Scott Evans and Mrs Jabez mentioned, I'm I'm the head of year 11, so I'm responsible from a pastoral perspective, behavioural attendance perspective. And I just wanted to bring you some research, really, and some data and some um, theories that have been proven to help year 11s and some evidence from past year groups and things like that. So initially, the basics, eating well, resting well, drinking lots of water. I was having a look out of interest today at how many hours um, per night it's advised for 15 to 16 year olds, um, how much sleep they should be having. And um, the, the average came to about nine hours. Some people said eight to 10, some said um, between seven and 11 hours. But if we average that, it's nine hours. Now, if your child is getting up at um, seven, let's say 7 a.m., that means they're going to bed at 10 p.m. And I think it's you might all be, you know, thinking now, oh, gosh, do, does my child actually get that much sleep? And it's something that's really important. Um, eating well, resting, getting our sleep and drinking lots of water are three really quite easy ways that we can make a difference. Um, and they're proven to be helpful. So let's look at why. So all of those things are linked to the brain. Essentially, the brain is always working even when we're asleep. It's always on takes care of our thoughts, our movements, um, our learning, our memory particularly, um, and what's fueling it is really important. So in terms of what we're eating, um, I'm sure we're all guilty of having the odd treat here and then, but it's actually really important um, to make sure that the students are getting um, a balanced diet, um, drinking enough water, not having too much sugary foods, not having um, high caffeine drinks and things like that, because they are not not helpful and they can actually be detrimental. Um, now, from a from a scientist perspective, I want to talk a little bit about how the brain works and how all these factors link into progress, because that's what we're looking at. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at exams. How is my child going to be um, making progress in their exams by the end of this year? So um, there is a function in the brain called neuroplasticity, which is basically the brain's ability to um, create and carve pathways and strengthen pathways, neural pathways within the brain. Um, and I want to link that to memory and recall and in exams. So um, every time you access a memory or every time you activate a memory, which is making a new memory, um, and encoding new information in the brain, neural pathways are strengthened and made. Um, and Mrs. Trebess has been talking about space learning, and this is really plays quite a big part in this in this strengthening of neural pathways. And the stronger these neural pathways are, there is a direct link to memory and recall, which obviously we know will have a direct link to exam success. So if we kind of work backwards, exam success, success obviously relies on our brains. Our brain relies on good sleep, it relies on food, and it relies on water. Every cellular process that takes place in your brain essentially involves water. So it's really important. A dehydrated brain is not a brain that's going to get much work done um, effectively. Um, another thing to do with the brain that's involved with neuroplasticity and memory is that um, the, the part of our brain that involves emotions, think like worry and anxiety, is in direct competition with the part of our brain that um, is involved with memory. So anxiety essentially competes with memory. So when we're having, um, if we're not managing to control feelings of worry or, or high emotions, what that can do is um, it competes with our what's called our working memory. So it reduces our brain capacity. And obviously we're doing our best to maximise brain capacity. So. We want to be using our brain capacity for encoding new information, for recalling memory, um, for en enjoying, you know, the extracurricular activities as well. Um, so 
that's something else to think about about regulating and managing um, emotions, extreme emotions, and things like that, because that has a direct impact on this on this neuroplasticity as well. Um, so that's the science lesson over. Um, now. This is always a bit of a controversial subject, computer games. Um, I'm well aware that teenagers play computer games. I'm not here to tell you that your teenager should never be playing computer games or to chuck the Xbox in the skip. However, we have to look at data and we have to look at evidence about the link between computer games and success in GCSEs. And it's quite interesting if you look at the difference. So two um, groups of, of students, some playing computer games twice a day, some playing once a week or less. And what you can see there is the difference in percentage or proportion of students that are achieving their five GCSEs. And that five GCSEs, including English and maths, is what seems to be is, is a gateway to most um, options going forward. So it's really important. And that's why that statistic has been used. And this is from the National Children's Bureau. So this is really good, um, reliable evidence. Um, I think something here, there's that saying is there, everything in moderation. There is there is nothing wrong with playing computer games. However, um, it can take away from your sleep, which we've just looked at is really important. That nine hours on average, computer games can eat into that quite badly. Um, there's the stimulation from your brain from blue light before bedtime is not good. It reduces your sleep. And also, most importantly, we can see the impact it has on um, success at GCSE. So that's something for you as families, I think, to discuss and come. I think what's a really good approach to this is coming up with a, a plan or a boundary um, as families and discuss it with your child so that everyone's on board with what's happening. Everyone's aware of, right, you've done, you can have a computer game once you've done this, this and this, or you can have the X amount of hours per week. So if everyone's involved in that decision, um, I think that's a nice way to approach it, for, to involve your children in that. Um, so that brings me on to attendance. Um, a, part, a big part of my role um, as head of year is looking at attendance and supporting students getting into school when their attendance starts to drop. Um, and as anything, I'm sure it's not a surprise to you um, to see that there is, again, a direct link between attendance and the percentages of students achieving that really important five or more GCSEs, level five to nine, um, including maths and English, because again, that's, that, that opens doors, achieving that basically. Um, so let's have a look at the data. You can see um, as a as a year group, we aim for 96 to 97% plus. Um, and you can see that the, the um, percentage then of students achieving that all important five or more five to nine grades, it's really quite high. And what you can also see is when that attendance starts to drop, even by quite small percentages, five each time, 5% each time, you can see how quickly and the percentage of students achieving those grades drops. Um, so you can see 20% is quite a nice one to, to, to think about because that's essentially one day a week. Um, if your child were to be off one day a week, let's say, um, you can see it's, it's actually only 30%, less than 30% of students that have one day off a week are achieving those five or more GCSEs. Um, and, and, it, and it drops as as attendance drops quite rapidly. Um, now, how can you support your child in coming to school? Firstly, um, we would ask that where possible, and I know it's not always possible, try to book medical appointments um, outside of school hours, um, po uh, you know, after 10 past three, because um, they can unfortunately take a quite a lot of a large chunk of your child's day away from them um, in school. And if um, if your child is feeling slightly under the weather, obviously we have to be careful thinking about COVID, but um, your child should only be off school if they are really quite unwell. Having a bit of a cold, feeling a bit tired, things like that, that we could in the past be tempted to take a day off school for, just can't happen, I'm afraid. Um, resilience is really important um, and is a, is a good character to grow in a child anyway. And um, you need to be having those conversations with your children about, I understand you don't feel well, however, you need to go in, um, you know, here's some cowpole, <laughs> get yourself to school essentially. Um, of course, checking any COVID symptoms, that goes without saying, hopefully. Um, let's have a look. So how, what, what does a successful year 11 student look like? Um, high attendance, again, I'm sure that comes as no surprise. 
um, students, there is a direct link between attendance and, and success, as we've just seen in progress um, in that last set of data. Um, punctuality, this is a really interesting one, and I think this is the case because punctuality shows that you're giving something priority. And if you're giving something priority in your school day, you're probably giving it priority at home as well. That 87% of your time that you spend away from school, if you're prioritising your lessons in school and making it important to you that you're on time and valuing the teacher's time that you have, then you're likely to be prioritising things correctly when you leave school. Um, period seven. So if your child is, is invited to period seven, are they attending? Those students that are attending, attending, making the most of that support that we're giving are finding that it's causing them to be successful. Holiday revision, exactly the same. If we're inviting you in for holiday sessions, make sure you're attending because we do see that it makes a difference. Yes, it's not a silver bullet by any means, but if that's being offered to you as a support, make the most of it because we do see that it makes a difference. Completing coursework. Um, I think that's a given really, isn't it? Making sure that your coursework, those NEAs are really up to scratch and complete and because um, they, for some courses, they can make up a large percentage of the course. Have you got the right revision strategy? So these students that are being successful are revising correctly. So Mrs Trebess mentioned your child might be working for hours and hours and hours working to the bone, but are they actually revising effectively? And that's something we're working on in forms, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, they're asking for help. This is so important. Are you communicating with your teachers? Again, those that are successful communicate with the teachers. They talk to them. They clarify things. They chase work that they've missed. They ask that extra question um, and all of those little things make a difference. Um, and another thing that um, builds a successful year 11 um, is making the most of the time that we give for a vision. So, for example, in our form groups, we have two form uh, times per week that we allow the students to revise um, quietly and in a in a really um, organised manner. Now, your child will know if they're making the most of that or not. But it's a, again, it's another support that we're putting in place. Um, is it being used effectively? Um, students that are, are sat there with your parents, I'm sure that's something you can think about yourself. Am I actually making the most of this time that's being given to me? So. That's what makes a successful student. What can you do at home? Let's have a look at that. That's always a question that parents ask me. What should I be doing? Should I be doing more? So simply to start with, does your child have somewhere to study? It can be the kitchen table, it can be a desk in their bedroom, it can be a study. Um, but having a place where they get into routine and study daily is really important. Um, do they have the correct equipment? These are all things we might think, well, of course, that's happening. They do make a difference. Have they got a calculator? Have they got um, revision guides? That guide's been sent out by Mrs Chabess. So all of that information you need about what they need um, is readily available. It's great having a space to study. Is it quiet or, do, or have you got the TV on in the background or, you know, are there younger siblings running around that are going to distract them? So things like that. Is it quiet? Is it... Um, a positive environment for learning. Organisation. We're working on this with, with form tutors to support your children with um, getting themselves organised. Are they getting into routine? Um, have they? Do they know what they should be doing every day in terms of their revision? Reading as well. Are they, are they making time for reading? Are they um, building that into their week as well? It's really important. Are you checking that your student, your, your child's actually been to period seven? You will, you will know if they've been invited to period seven. Are you checking that they've been? Are you following that up? Things like that. A bit of accountability um, goes a long way. Have they done what they've claimed to do? They're saying, yeah, I've done all my homework. Brilliant. Have they actually done it? It's worth having a look. And it's, it's interesting for you guys as parents and carers to see the, um, the level of work that your child is producing because you will have an idea of their ability and their effort. And it's very interesting. It can be really interesting for you to open their book, have a look. Um, are they doing the work properly? What's their teacher saying to them in their feedback? Because that will just help you build a, a picture of your child as a student and what you could perhaps do to support them more. Um, so today in form time, and this is done at the end of year 10 as well and has been done um, periodically throughout the term already, your child was given a revision timetable. Um, uh, this is something they are quite used to now doing in form. Um, the reason we do this is there's two reasons. Firstly, to help your child get organised, um, to make them plan out their week, prioritise what's important um, and just 
build a picture of their week um, so they know what they're doing. Now, we don't ask students to fill this with um, revision because it's not realistic and it wouldn't be right. So you can see the grey area is when they're in school. Friday after school, we've blanked out because I don't know about you, but not a huge amount of work gets done on a Friday at the end of the week. So we think, well, students are probably going to be the same there. So let's let them have Friday evening off. We then encourage them to put in any extracurricular activities like football on a Saturday morning, um, any you know birthdays or any events that they know they're going to, and then starting to add in 45 minute chunks across their week. And the reason for that is number one, 45 minutes is an effective time to revise. And number two, um, it means that when they sit down to revise, they already know what they're going to do. So the chances of success are much higher. Um, so this is something you can ask you know, your, your child should have it. They were given it today. Um, the second reason we do that is to help with accountability and to help them show you that they're being responsible. And that can really help with um, the, the conversations at home. So if your child is going, look, this is what I've done. This is my plan for the week. On Tuesday night, I'm doing a bit of history and you have a look at what they're doing on Tuesday. They are doing history. You can see that they're taking responsibility. So it just builds up that pos those positive interactions between um, students and parents. Um, and I think that's all from me in terms of from a pastoral perspective. So I'm going to hand back to Mr Scott Evans, I think. Thank you very much. You so um, I'm sure there's probably some questions that you'd like to to ask and hopefully you've been putting those into the uh, the chat function of, as we've been speaking. Um, one of the questions I often get asked is whether I think uh, their child should should get a, a tutor. Um, I, I would I would say that that shouldn't be necessary. That, um, that that at Beckett Keys we will provide everything that your child needs. Um, that if you stick with us, as you can see tonight, our teachers know what they're talking about, and they have a great track record of getting students to to succeed. We will ensure your student does well. But tutors are sometimes helpful, and if you can afford one, then it's obviously up to you to do that. All I would say is make sure that they know. Uh, the exam boards that we teach. For example, there is a massive difference between uh, English exam boards and the Edexcel exam board that we use is very different to say AQA and a, and a tutor may be inadvertently training your child for the wrong exam. And we've seen students actually seemingly getting worse as a result of tutor input because they're confusing them over what they should be doing uh, in school. Feel free to liaise with us and, and your child's teacher if you are thinking about getting a tutor. So at least we can make sure that we're giving the right messages to them. The, the thing that I would like to finish with is uh, the mocks. Mrs Trebess mentioned making the most of the mocks and we've got two sets of mocks um, to work through. Mocks are really helpful in terms of preparing us uh, for exams. So we've got some mocks coming out. It's a great idea to revise for them specifically. Taking mocks helps show you where you're weak and where you need to revise and where you need to uh, improve. And it also gets you used to the pressure of sitting exams in an exam hall with official invigilators and so on. That's why we, we do mocks in school. And uh, I'm going to share with you my own mock disaster um, here on, on the screen. So here you go. This is Mr Scott Evans failures in his mocks. I had a very bad attitude to my mocks when I was your age at school and I had this idea that I would not revise for my mocks. I'd see how I could get on and then identify the subjects that I did need to revise for. So I didn't revise for my mocks at all and as you can see I got a very bad set of results. I did do quite well in maths and English so that did help me. I thought, well, OK, I'm good at those, but I did so badly in these other subjects. I left myself too much to do for the real thing. Um, I had to shift my English literature from an E and I managed to shift it all the way to an A, but that, gave, that took so much hard work. It limited me in what I could do elsewhere. Uh, I needed to shift my French to a pass, my physics to a pass, my chemistry to a pass, which I managed to do. But then other subjects that I really should have done a lot better with, um, I didn't manage to get the grades that I deserved. Um, economics, um, geography, ICT, these are all subjects that I clearly could have got better grades in. So really encourage you not to do that, to work hard for your mocks, to make the most of them, and the revision that you do for them is effectively 
learning that you've put in the bank, as Mrs. Trebess has explained, it puts it into the bank for you, ready for those real exams when they come. So please do make the most of those mock opportunities. OK, uh, we're going to stop there and see what what questions have come in. We've got Mr. Fenn uh, on the line. So if you've got some questions there for us, Mr. Fenn, how's it looking? Hello, yes, got quite a few questions that are coming in. Um, I'll try and tie a few questions into one because um, yeah. uh, there's a lot of overlap with some of them. So um, several questions about the parent guide uh, that was emailed out. Mm. Um, if parents haven't got a copy of that, um, is there a good way for them to request that or access that? OK, what do you think, Mrs. Chavez? Perhaps you can come up and yeah. um, help co-host the, yeah, the questions no and answers for me. So they should have all had one by email. Um, if they haven't had one by email and they want one by email, then yes, they can email the office to ask for that to be sent again by email. It's also possible that we could get some paper copies um, done, a few paper copies if anybody specifically wanted to request a paper copy. So yes, please do request um, via the school office. Yeah, I'd say if you're a, uh, an electronic copy kind of person, send us an email and we'll get it across to you. If you're a paper copy kind of person, how about send your child in with a paper note and bring it to the office and say, please, can I have a paper copy of the guide? OK, thank you, Mr. Fenn. Yeah, a um, couple of questions around COVID and exams and what exams might look like in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, I know you briefly touched on that, but could you just uh, reiterate that? Yeah, well, we are still waiting for the exam boards to announce what the changes are going to be. They have done a consultation which gave us a clue that they are planning to expect students to have studied the whole syllabus. And then around Easter time next year, they will tell schools, parents, students exactly which bits of the syllabus are going to be examined. So the idea is schools continue to teach the whole syllabus for now. Then at Easter, they will tell us which bits are going to be in the exams and then that will help us drill down on those particular areas. But that was just a consultation. That's not necessarily what they are definitely going to do. And as soon as we know more, we will be letting you know at home as, as well. Is that a fair summary, Mrs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. OK. A um, few questions around the half term interventions. Um, again, just can you give some clarity on when parents will expect to receive information on whether their child's been invited or not? OK, Mr. Spex, yeah. You? It should be. Um, I'm looking to send them out before the end of this week. So we usually try and tell you a couple of weeks before the, the holiday if your son or daughter is going to be invited in. We can't tell you any earlier than that because obviously we are constantly assessing and seeing where students are at. And it's it's not always um, the same group of students. As yeah. Mr. Chabess said, we, we chop and change. We try and give everyone different opportunities. Sometimes we'll bring in the students who are aiming for a grade eight or nine for a particular session. Other times we'll be bringing in students who are currently a grade three and need to move to a four. It's not always the lowest attaining. It's not always the highest attaining. Sometimes it could be students from across the ability range, but they just didn't understand that particular unit. Maybe it was something that was taught during lockdown a particular science topic that was hard for them to understand. We bring all those students together and we teach them that thing again. So obviously we, we will give you as much notice as we can, uh, but that's why Mrs. Trebess says tongue in cheek, don't book any holidays because you don't want to miss those those opportunities. Thank you. That links in quite nicely to this next question, actually, um, some of which you've kind of already answered. Um, do you have specific examples of where changes have been made to the curriculum to fill the gaps in knowledge that were seen across certain students. So I would imagine that we talk about QLA and possibly the online curriculum there, mm. Mr. Bess. Yeah, so all students, all, I've sent a letter home today actually, um, informing all parents where they can look for schemes of work. So basically we call them schemes of work. It's what students are studying. It is the curriculum over time. Um, and heads of department were busy over the summer looking at the year 10 exams, um, writing department development plans where we had action points from the year 10 exams. And as part of that, reviews of the curriculum were done. So 
you will find the online curriculum, the curriculum that students are studying this year, that might be slightly different to what they were studying last year in terms of the order in which they're doing it, the time that they're taking on each topic. I mean, the specifications for GCSE are the same currently, like Mr Scott Evans was saying, exam boards, we're waiting to see if any changes have been made. Um, but the specifications remain the same, but the, the way in which we teach it and the, the period of time we spend on each topic might vary depending on the year 10 exam. So that's really where the changes have been made and you can access and see what they're studying when through the online curriculum on the website. Do you think that answers the question, um, Mr Fenn? You can see them there, is that? Yeah, I think so. I think maybe a, a brief mention around the question level analysis that every teacher has done in light of the end of year 10 exams. Yeah, so Mrs. Trebess showed a, a slide of a, a man surrounded by papers. And, and what, so what we do is we, we go through those papers, we mark every single question, and then we put the mark for every single student for every single question into spreadsheets and into computer programs that will analyse where students have not answered well. And then we'll be able to see across the cohort where there are, are weaknesses or particular groups of students that have been weak in, in particular areas. And heads of department, as Mrs Trebess have said, has, have done this analysis and have then fed back to me and Mrs Trebess and people from RET on where the areas of weakness are. Will you then report that to you as parents just about your individual child and you'll be getting a year 11 report soon which will tell you areas in which your child has has struggled and particular areas in which they need to revise so there might be something in geography where there's a gcse pod uh, that they can watch to help reinforce some some knowledge that isn't secure thank you yeah um questions around the mock exams coming up um are the students still going to be in lessons when they don't have exams or are they going to be on study leave? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, no, they won't be on study leave. They will be in school, so they will have supervised revision. So where there's, I don't know, let's say there's a drama exam in the main hall. If they don't study drama, they will be in their normal timetabled lessons. Um, those will either be uh, a lesson where they're being taught something ready to help them in their exam, or it will be, like Mrs Brown was explaining, supervised revision time. So they'll bring with them revision materials and they'll use that time productively to revise for an exam that they do have coming up. So we have them in school and we help them revise um, just like we do in the, um, in the exams as well. We provide um, revision spaces for them to be um, in school when they don't have exams. Um, another question around uh, revision. We are obviously running interventions which are invite only. Are there um, revision clubs, sort of open invite clubs? Yeah, good question. We've got plans for open invite clubs. No, I mean, we we have homework club every evening where students can go and do their homework and there's always a, a teacher on duty there to help them um, with revision or work they've got to do. Um, we also have tutor time. Um, they have a learning journal in which they complete activities that help them to understand themselves as learners and to teach them about different revision techniques. Um, so they're doing those activities during form time. And in addition, we have got a day in November where we're inviting external um, com an external company to come in and deliver information about how to succeed in exams. Um, and that includes uh, a membership to an online portal that students can use throughout the year to support them with their revision. Um, but there isn't, I don't think, an actual revision club as such, but there are certainly um, all of those things to support them with their revision. Thank you. I think on the enrichment timetable, there are some subjects that offer clubs. So I know there's a DT club, yeah, a there's, food there's club, some Spanish. Sub some subjects like offer, you might see it on the extracurricular timetable as has time or HAS time, which is help and support time. So quite a few departments do offer drop-in sessions and I know that you know most or all subject teachers actually you know if students say oh, I just need a bit of help with that they can always stay behind after lessons or arrange a time with their subject teacher to go through things. Yeah thank you. 
and re- revision skills are, are sort of taught during the PSHE curriculum in year 11 as well. Yeah. Um, got a few more questions. Um, so, what's your opinion on listening to music whilst revising? Is this okay? That's a good question. It is a good question. Um, there's not a single exam that takes place where students are allowed to listen to music whilst they do the exam. You can't even listen to music when you do art. Uh, There was a time when students were allowed to listen to music whilst they did the art exam. You have to do the art exam in complete silence. The danger of listening to music is that you then become used to the sensation of listening to music whilst you study. So uh, I would avoid it. I also think that music is more of a distraction than people realise. If you were going to listen to music, you'd probably listen to some classical music or something like that. Um, so I would definitely avoid listening to music. Uh, Mrs. Trebess was mentioning how as you get tired, as time goes on, maybe you use GCSE pod or something, you know, you may get to a point where you've done some really good revision in silence and you're now going to reward yourself with having some music on whilst you complete some of your NEA coursework. I could imagine that working. I don't know what you think, Mrs. Brown, Ms. Brown about music i think even just from a science perspective i think again it's the brain's going to it's going to be competing with the parts of the brain that need to be used so i think while i understand students wanting to i don't i would agree i don't think it's a good idea no No. so i would get phone right out of area because phone is the place you get music and phone means people contacting you things popping up from whatsapp things popping up from instagram and that is a disaster you get to your 45 minute session you give your phone to your parents and you say, I'm going in, I'm going in and I'm going to revise my Spanish and you concentrate on it for that 45 minutes, then have 15 minutes listening to music and going on your phone and going for a walk. Can I just come in on the phone issue? Um, a re- again, a really interesting study to do with phones. There was a study done where um, identical twins had uh, took some intelligence tests one of them didn't have a phone on the table one of them had it on the table just on the table not even up not even using it and it was found that it has an impact so even just having it there is a distraction because we're so used to using it so even just oh it's no i'm not on it i'm not using it is not actually is not going to cut it so no. yeah getting it out of sight i think it's yeah. really important and miss brown chose to talk about computer games which are a massive distraction um but equally some people don't play games on their phone at all but social media is even more of a distraction um, than the computer games and can be really quite negative to mental health and healthy thinking so i would definitely give yourself a break from the phone sorry that was all about music but i got onto a real rant there so (laughs) sorry um a couple of questions on past papers exam papers and things like that do um do subject teachers provide those or are students expected to find them online and practice them themselves? That is a great question. We'll go back to Mrs. Trebess who was mentioning those. Yeah, in the main, um, you can expect subject teachers to provide those. We would prefer that you ask if you want extra ones, you've not been given them, that you ask your subject teacher for them yeah. um, rather than going rooting around on on exam websites um we'd prefer to to give you the ones that we think are the most appropriate to prepare you for your exam so yes those exam papers should come from school um question on rapid progress so if if students um maybe started off at the end of year 10 on a grade three or four and in their mock exams ended up making rapid progress Hmm. are there opportunities for um changing from a foundation to a higher tier paper Hmm. um and i guess anything else related to that kind of question yeah very very few subjects have foundation tier papers anymore um but final decisions about whether you take foundation or higher tier in maths or uh in Spanish and Mandarin, I know have them. Science. Science um, won't be made until after these mocks. So yes, there's still plenty of time for students to make that that progress. And you know, we could tell you so many stories of students that have made huge progress from those first mocks. You know, multiple grades of progress. Um, but as Miss Brown said, there all the students who did those things that you need to do. Those things don't happen automatically they're not just things that happen to clever people they're people who are putting the the work in so yes 
keep working hard, see those grades rise, and yes, changes could be made to uh, tiers. Thank you. Um, got a few more. I'll try and rattle through these um, quickly. Um, yeah. Can students attend intervention remotely um, if they're not able to come in person? No, not unless there was a, a serious medical issue that was preventing them from attending. So I suppose if there was, you know, if, if they were having to self isolate with with COVID, it might be that we could set up uh, Microsoft Teams, but um, no, not, not in general. Thank you. Um, after the mock exams and after students receive their results, um, how will students find out uh, which topics they're, they're weak on and yeah. how that information gets shared? Okay. Yeah, um, so after the mock exams, we'll go through the same process that we went through with the year 10 um, end of year exams and we'll do question level analysis and we'll look at student performance across the board and what grade they got. Um, and then we hold a parents evening with subject teachers and parents and students and we can take you through basically their exam results question by question telling you which ones they did well on telling you what they didn't do well on giving you a plan of action uh, to move forward with their revision and what they need to do next so that parents evening in January is really really important and that's where you'll find that information from. And, and students, you really need to stick with your teachers through this year. As I said, you're you're flying the the aeroplane, um, but those teachers will be guiding you through it step by step. They will be supporting you with these these things that you need to learn. They'll be pulling those papers apart with you in class, giving you time to talk to to your peers about them. So make the most of those opportunities. Thank you. Um, two questions in one. Um, what should a student do if they don't know their GCSE pod? Login details, I'll answer that one. Uh, they can come and speak to me, Mr. Fenn, uh, and I'll um, I'll give them that information. And um, what there's, there's several um, students or parents who don't think that their child has got a learning journal um, or they may have lost it. I'm assuming the answer is to, to speak to their form tutor. Is that right? I presume so. We haven't yet. Yeah. We we haven't given those out yet. So if they haven't got them yet, that's why. Um, but there's something that, that they will be working from um, as we get to the run up to the mock exams. Thank you. Um, and I think that is most of them. Um, just having a look to see if there's anything I've missed. I think most of my questions have incorporated uh, a lot of the questions that are there. Whilst you, whilst you continue to peruse through Mr Fenn I just want to finish with a few uh, in encouraging words you know the, I'm really really proud of this group of year 11s you've been through a tough time with with Covid through the last couple of years um, but you remain a, a year group that I've got great confidence in um, you are actually statistically the most academic year group we've ever had in in the school you're the you're the students that have entered the school from primary school with the highest entry grades um, and despite the the troubles that you've been through you've continued to make good progress I've been watching you in your lessons recently I came to see a number of you with Mrs Trebess actually uh, the other day in an English lesson and I'm thrilled with the the attitude that you're taking towards your 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 work You've got to keep going with your homework, you've got to hand things in, you've got to be here, you've got to be working in your lessons, you've got to get to them punctually. But if you stick with us, we can help you land that plane. You know, you have so much around you to support you. You're in one of the highest performing schools in Essex. Last time there were league tables, we were the third best uh, state school that isn't a grammar school in the whole of Essex. So you're in good hands, we know what we're doing. We can help you land this plane. Just got to stick with us. Keep doing what your teachers are asking you to do. Do the revision that they're setting for you. Do the past papers. Do the homework. If you stick with us, we will succeed. We will land this plane successfully uh, with you. You're in good shape and you're in good hands. OK, so thank you for joining us um, this evening. It's run over the hour slightly, but not to the to the extent that I thought it might. So thank you for sticking with us through to the end. It's been great to, ha to have you there and keep in touch with us. Um, you can contact us via the, the website. As Mr Fenn said, if you don't have a GCSE pod password, you can email him via the, the website, um, the staff contacts form are there or the tutor, 
Miss Brown, Mrs Trebess or, or your subject teachers are all there to assist you through this, this important year. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Please start logging off now and we'll see you again soon. Bye bye.